<laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> Does not look like it. <laughs> but we are recording, just so you know. Okay. Oh. Nope, we have to let them in, that's why. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Hello. Hi, how are you? Fine. Good. I didn't realize you weren't already certified, so I'm glad you could join us. I'm sorry? But I didn't realize you hadn't already been certified. No. No, I know Scott has been a member for, for years and years and years, and um, I, I, I have not, so I'm looking forward to <laughs> Learning. Sure. There you go. Haven't seen you in a long time. I know. I kind of, I kind of been moving gradually farther north, but <laughs> <Yeah>. you guys <laughs> doing okay down there? Yeah. 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 We'll give everybody, we had to think about 13 or 14 people registered, so we'll give everybody a few minutes to get on. So you're still, I am echoing, sorry. No, that's okay. It, it actually doesn't sound bad on my end. Good. You're still working from home? Yep, we, we are. I think we are um, tentatively phasing in um, a staggered work schedule starting in July. Yeah, what about you guys? I'm still working from home. Um, it's, some are working at the office, but but um, they haven't come out with this with the with the um, next procedure officially yet. Okay. Gotcha. Hello to everybody joining us. Um, let's see. We're gonna give it just another minute or two and then we'll get started. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute everybody. We have a pretty small group. We'll go through this as well. So um, if you guys just want to sort of be the master of your own fate and sort of mute and unmute yourselves as you have things to say, I'll let you take care of that unless there's some sort of issue. Andrew, maybe like two more minutes. Sure.
just just so you know, um, I just set Nick as a co-host as well, just in case I have to I have to run out. Nick Nick is gonna be the backup. I think we might have one or two more people joining us, but it's a little bit after three, so I think we can um, go ahead and get started. So um, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I had gotten in touch with um, Andrew earlier this year before we knew we were gonna have a pandemic and just said, hey, you know what? Um, I was really overwhelmed. <coughs> when I was preparing to take my AICP exam and I went to this really great um, info session in Charlottesville and would you be willing to do that for us? And he graciously agreed. And then we got hit with COVID-19. <laughs> and so we moved it to a virtual opportunity, but I think um, hopefully this has made it more accessible to, to all of y'all. And we'll also be, just so you know, we will be recording this um, to put on the APA Virginia chapters website as a future resource as well. So hopefully there will be um, some good ongoing benefit from it. Um, I have, from my perspective, I'm going to leave everybody unmuted and you can kind of mute and unmute yourselves. Um, I think we're going to try to the extent that it makes sense and isn't confusing because there's a <clears throat> a relatively small number of participants to just sort of have this be an open fluid back and forth. So if you have a question, you can unmute yourself to ask a question. If you don't want to do that, um, you can also use that chat feature at the bottom of the main screen. Um, or if you go to the, if you open the, um, if you go to the bottom of your screen and click on participants and that participant window opens, you can also raise your hand that way to be called on. So there are a couple of, of different ways to do that. But um, as long as it works and it isn't too um, confusing or anything like that, um, we'll just sort of let it be let it be a free flow discussion. And um, if you know that there's background noise or something like that, just keep yourself on mute unless you you want to raise a question. And if you have any um, any issues muting or unmuting yourself, you can you can send a chat to me or just send a chat in the main box and I'll make sure that that is taken care of. Um, otherwise, this is pretty much um, Andrew's show to run. Just keep in mind that we are recording this. Um, and Andrew, I'll let you introduce yourself and um, get started with your presentation. Sounds great. Thank you, Sandy. I greatly appreciate you pulling this together for us. Um, my name is Andrew Hopewell. I am the chapter's professional development officer. And so that means I help uh, prepare uh, members for the AICP exam. I help uh, AICP members earn their certification credits um, and generally help with the professional development of our, our membership. Uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm the Assistant Chief of Planning up in Fauquier County, so where I focus primarily on long range comprehensive planning, demographic analyses, those sorts of fun things. Um, because this is such a broad topic and there's uh, folks from a variety of different uh, sort of levels and, and, and different interests here, I was hoping we could potentially just go around and, and maybe introduce ourselves and what we're hoping to get out of this just so I can try and tailor um, what I'm talking about to make sure we hit everybody's um, interests. So if you don't mind, I'll just, I'll, I'll, call, I'll call you guys out by name and if you could just briefly introduce yourself, where, where you're from and, and, and what your, your interest in the ICP is, where you're at in the process, uh, I'd greatly appreciate that. So I'm just going to go across on my screen here. So Kelly, you're, you're up first. All right. Um, sorry for that. Uh, I'm a planner at the, at the PDC and, and I do not have a planning degree. I have an engineering degree. So um, I, I had, you know, just start to investigate into the process of being a member of APA and, and just what the process is. So I'm, I'm very foundational and <laughs> not so much pushing right towards the AICP at this point, but, but wanting to learn more about the, the chapter. Um, so. Sure. Well, great. Well, glad you're here. Uh, but, I, but I have been working in the, you know, as a planner in the planning department for, for, for numerous years, but but okay. a different um, background. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, well, I think, I think folks come into planning from all sorts of different backgrounds. I know I was a, an economics and history undergrad major, so uh, yeah. we, we all come from, from different places. 
Um, Brad, how about, how about you, if you want to introduce yourself? Uh, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm senior planner in Flu, Flu Um Been in the profession 16, almost 17 years, and it's always been a, something I like to accomplish and get under my belt. Um, so I am got my date set up for my exam and uh, have attempted it before. So this is a second try for me. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, Cassie, how about yourself? Cassie, are you there? I see you're off mute, but we can't, I can't hear anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> Transportation planner at Virginia Beach. Great. Uh, John, how about introducing yourself? Sure. Hey guys, my name is John Harden. Um, I am the Vice President for Membership with the Virginia Chapter of the American Planning Association and um, I am AICP um, and I am um, interested in possibly um, taking over the reins from Andrew at some point in, in his capacity. So I'm here just kind of learning uh, about what what he does, but I'm happy to hear that there's a, a variety of folks on the line, including, uh, it sounded like the first person Kelly mentioned, she's just getting in to know what the chapter's about. So I'd love to connect with you, Kelly, and um, tell you more about the chapter and some of the benefits of being a member of this chapter. So happy to be with you all. Hey, thank you. Thanks, John. Josh, how about yourself? Josh, you there? Oh, there you go. Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. I had to unmute myself to be heard. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Sandy. Um, I'm Josh Gillespie. I work in uh, Chesterfield County for county government. I've worked in uh, local and state governments and have a background uh, specifically in history and historic preservation. So I've worked as a preservation planner and worked sort of in the more uh, normal planning world, community planning and development, and then also more in the preservation world. And I'm, I'm getting more back into land use and development planning and have returned to Central Virginia after having worked in Northern Virginia for about two years. So uh, real excited to have an opportunity to, to uh, go for AICP again. I actually was uh, one of the first to uh, head AICP about 10 years ago and did not maintain my credits. Uh, because at that time there were just weren't as many virtual opportunities to maintain and a lot of my activities were not in the traditional field. So I had, hard, I had a hard time getting CMs then. So this is a retest for me. All right, well hopefully second time is uh, easier than the, 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 the first time. <laughs> it comes yep. back to you quickly, hopefully. Yep. Um, Therese, how about yourself? Hi, I'm Sharice Franklin and I work with Sandy at the TJPDC as a planner and I, uh, I've i never went for my AICP. Um, I, I do have a degree in planning and I graduated in 2015 with my grad degree and I've always wanted to do it and I just never did. There was always something else to do. So um, I, I just am a bit intimidated by the process and I want to uh, get some tips <laughs> on how sure. to to get it done and get it done once, hopefully. <laughs> well, you've got several AICPs on here with you as well as folks who have, have been through the process, so we can certainly share some tips. Um, Tyler, how about yourself? Hey, this is Tyler Walter. I'm a senior planner at Chesterfield County. I work in the same team as Josh Gillespie, actually. Um, I graduated from VCU with my master's in urban planning about three years ago, so was kind of doing the fast, the new fast track process after you get your degree to go straight into the AICP exam. Kind of got slowed up for a couple of years after I graduated. So trying to see what's the best way to study for this exam and just get the, find which items I should study and focus on the most to get a passing grade so that I can only take it once. Understandable, understandable. Nick, how about yourself? Hey, good afternoon. Um, yeah, Nick Morrison. I'm also a planner at the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission, so I work closely with Sharice and Sandy. Um, I've been here for a little over four years. 
Um, so this is my first job straight out of grad school and kind of similar to, to some other folks on the call. Um, as life gets in the way, just um, haven't, haven't pursued the, the certification yet, but Sandy has spoken to the, the um, you know, the credentialing. And so I'm just excited to learn more about the process and um, yeah, go from there. Great, great. Uh, Cameron. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cameron Langell, and I'm a senior planner with Albemarle County. And um, yeah, this will be my first time taking the AICP test. I mean, I've, I, I got approved to do it last summer, so I've missed two testing cycles. But um, I guess I'm here today just to get some tips. Sure, sure, great. And I think that 434 number, that's Brad, right? You're, you're uh, calling in. Okay, so that, that's a right. Terrific. All right, uh, I'm going to run through this. This is a, uh, what I've got here is essentially a combination of a couple different presentations that I've pulled together. So um, I'll try and go through the parts that I don't think are as relevant quickly. Um, some of the other ones, we'll, we'll see how much detail we go into. If you have questions along the way, uh, I think we're a small enough group, just go ahead and ask them. Um, and we'll look to try and address them there. And uh, Josh, I see you got a, a raised hand. What, what can we do for you? Well, I just wanted to check to make sure that that's probably the best way to ask a question for you. Is that okay while you're going, just to raise hands instead of uh, um, buzzing? You know, I think probably just butt in because I'm going to have the uh, the presentation up on my screen, so I may not be able to to necessarily see the hand raising. Um, and again, I think we're we're a small enough group that uh, you you can just just interrupt me and uh, we'll get let's get the question answered. Okay, thank you. If you're really shy and want to raise your hand, I'll try to keep a lookout. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. All right, so let's go ahead and start this up. And all right, does so everybody see a presentation? No, yes. no not yet. Okay. I'm going to wait because I haven't hit the share button. <laughs> there we go. All right. Here we go. So I um, wanted to talk today about just AICP and, and the four main things that I wanted to cover were just the different paths that you can go to AICP. This was, was hinted at a little bit. We've now got the, uh, in addition to the traditional path where you go to school, get your education, work for a number of years, and then look to take the exam. Um, we have the AICP candidate route as well now where you can um, look to take the exam right out of school and uh, then earn your experience and then submit your essays. So we're gonna talk about that briefly. Uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the exam itself, what, what some of the information that you'll be tested on, um, some, some tips, some guidance there. Uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the essays um, because increasingly they're emphasizing that, that there's the two parts to earning your AICP certification. There's the exam and the essays. And a lot of people in the past have taken the essays rather lightly and, and unfortunately ended up getting tripped up by that. So I'll take a little bit of time just to talk briefly about what you're expected to discuss in those essays. And then we'll have just some open questions and, and we, can, we can cover any other topics that, that I haven't hit on um, in the course of, of the presentation. So as I mentioned with, with the paths to AICP, the traditional sequence, you go to school, um, you get your degree, either your undergraduate or your graduate, get the relevant number of years of professional planning experience, depending on what, what sort of degree you have. And then you submit your essays and take your exam, and then you become certified assuming you pass. Um, the past couple of years, they introduced the candidate program, whereby you can take that exam. You, you enroll while you're still in graduate school or an undergraduate in, in the planning degree. You can take the exam right out of school, when, when particularly the law and the history are, are much fresher in your mind. and uh, if you're successful with that exam, you then become an AICP candidate. Um, over the next couple of years, then you earn your uh, professional planning experience. You do take some of the continuing education courses or certification maintenance courses. Um, and then once you've gathered enough professional planning experience, you then submit your essays um, to earn your full certification to AICP. Um, I think we're, we're, we're going to kind of skip over this a little bit because by the sounds of most of the folks here, um, the, the, the candidate program is not as much of an option. If you do have um, particular questions, we, we can touch on those later. 
Um, but this is something that does is relevant for the, uh, one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time in terms of when you can take the exam. Um, this one is talking about graduation, but it's, it's also the, the matter of when you've qualified with enough experience. So you need to have the experience completed before you submit uh, your request to take the exam, essentially. Um, so if you're hoping to take the exam in the November timeframe, you need to essentially have that experience um, before you, you um, request that in, in the, uh, the May or June timeframe. Um, similarly, if you want to take it in the May timeframe, you need to have it before the end of the previous year. Um, so as I said, at the end of that candidate program, you look to do your, your essays. These are the same essays that, that the uh, traditional route does. It's just the timing is a little bit different. Uh, one of the benefits of the candidate program is the way the payments are structured. Um, in this one, you, it's a small fee to enroll in the program and it's a, a smaller fee to take the exam. It's the $100 fee to take the exam um, and then the bulk of the fees are due when you submit your essays to become AICP certified. The benefit to that is if you do struggle and don't pass the exam, it's not as significant of an outlay um, because otherwise in the traditional scheme, you pay the 475 to take the exam itself when you submit the essays. So this is a benefit to, to the candidate program. There's a whole lot of information on the APA website about this. Um, again, I apologize if I've skipped over anything here, but I, I think the candidate program is not really the route that most of, most of the folks here are going through, so I wanted to just go through that quickly. So I wanted to focus the bulk of our time today looking at the exam itself and, and sort of ways that you can prepare for the exam. Um, and I apologize for the change in format here, but I've borrowed this presentation from um, the folks who, who prepared the uh, exam preparation at the national conference of folks out of Chicago, Chicago, um, Trevor Dick, who was the PDO of the Illinois chapter for many years, along with uh, Devin Levine and John Hausiel, who have a, a, a firm there. And they've actually traveled around the country and, and, and um, give these sorts of presentations at various times. National Capital Chapter does it about every other year. And so um, if you're able to, in terms of when you're looking at the exam to uh, attend that, I would strongly recommend it. They do a really great job with this presentation. But the purpose uh, of the exam is really to, to think, to test how you think as a planner and, and, and not just as a planner in any particular field of planning, but to general planning. So you're going to be tested on all aspects and not in any one particular geographical context. So you need to try and make sure you take yourself out of the mindset of how you necessarily do things in your day to day job and think of yourself as, as a generic planner in any town USA. Um, so you're gonna see a, a, a you know, question, multiple choice questions. All the, the whole exam is set up with multiple choice questions where you have to choose the best answer. And so they could give you options of different ones um, in terms of you know, the option one, could be option one and two, one, two and three, one, three and four. Um, so, and again, it's just, the types of question that you may get in terms of thinking these are not specific ones, obviously, but you know, um, just trying to test your thinking and your thought process. So if a bat and a ball cost a dollar ten in total, and the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Do we have a brave volunteer who wants to to put forward a guess? Go for it, Josh. <laughs> uh, the ball costs ten cents. Number one. You'd think that, but if the ball costs 10 cents and the bat cost a dollar more than the ball, then the bat would cost a dollar 10 and they cost a dollar 10 in total. So the answer here is actually five cents. So it's five cents for the ball and a dollar five for the bat. Ouch. So in total, a dollar 10. So it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes you, you may have that intuitive response to something, but make sure you, you slow down and read that question fully um, just to. Uh, to, to make sure that you, you, you're looking at it. So similarly, these are these are just a couple of fun examples we'll go through. So if it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? We have any other brave volunteers? Well, I'll, I'll, oh, Tyler, go for it. 
Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I'm just going to say that it's probably not two, just because it seems like that's too easy. Correct. It is not but two. I, that, but other than that, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I'd probably have to sit and think about it for more. Sure. Uh, well, just after uh, the first question, it seemed like a gotcha. <laughs> It is, it is a little bit, and uh, the answer here is actually four. It's five minutes, because essentially each machine takes five minutes to make a widget. So 100 machines would take, 100, would take five minutes to make 100 widgets. Um, uh, I think this is the last one of these. So patch of lily pads, every day the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half of the lake? Need one more volunteer. And I'll give you the hint that it's not 24 days. <laughs> <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to jump in? Sure, sure. Go for it, Sandy. Uh, it's going to be 47 days. That's right, because it doubles each time. So at 47 days, it would be half and double on that 48th day to cover the entire uh, lake. All of these were directly off of the exam that I took, by the way. <laughs> All right, this one I wanted to take a little bit, uh, a minute to just to, to highlight, because this is something that you, not in terms of the, the actual numbers here, but, but something that you will come across in the exam. Which of these numbers is greater than zero? And I'll, I'll go straight to what the answer is. In this case, the answer they're looking for here is D, two. The reason being that is the one that is greatest, greater than zero, so to speak. So, it feels like it's a trick question because C is certainly also greater than zero, but they're looking for the most correct answer. And so particularly when you find yourself with some of the ethics questions, um, they're looking for what is going to be the most correct answer. So as I, I, I tell people when they're preparing for the exam, when you're looking at those ethics questions, you really, I hate to say it, have to take yourself out of the real world and look at it in a, an ideal world situation. Um, if you had all the resources available to you in the world to be able to handle something in the most ethically um, acceptable way possible, how would you handle it? And so that's a question like this, where there may be multiple options that you think would be acceptable. Which one is, is the best one? And that's the answer that they are looking for. So the structure of the exam itself, it's 170 multiple choice questions. Um, they're only actually scoring 150 of them towards your final score, but of course you don't know which ones those are. Um, and they are testing two main areas, your knowledge and your skills. Um, the exam is four hours, three and a half hours for the actual questions, and then they have a half hour tutorial or half hour built in for a tutorial just to get you comfortable with the format of it. And you do find out immediately after taking the exam how you did on it. So you'll know, you'll get an unofficial result immediately thereafter. I say unofficial because there have been a couple instances where if they find a particular question is um, tracking that it's showing to be extraordinarily difficult or, or you know, potentially being misinterpreted, um, they can potentially scale scores up slightly. Uh, they will never scale scores down, but they could scale them up slightly. Um, so it's a computer-based exam. Um, there's the two 12-day windows. Um, there's different exam questions. So, you know, if you and a colleague take the exam at the same time, you won't be seeing necessarily the same questions and certainly not the same order. Um, they are going to be uh, mixed up. Um, and there are some questions that are repeated from year to year. So some of the common myths are that you can prepare by studying one book. That's certainly not the case. Um, that once you're, the, one, that the exam is the be all and end all, and that's also not the case. Um, as an AICP member, you do have those continuing expectations for certification maintenance credits, so ongoing training, um, and that you can prepare by memorizing information. Um, memorizing certain aspects, particularly as it pertains to history and law, uh, is very beneficial, but there's no way that you can memorize everything to do with um, field of planning. Because again, this is, this is uh, a broad exam that's testing sort of all aspects of your understanding of the field of planning. 
so the advice is to certainly start studying early when you're going to want to look at all different sources of material and learning uh, practice exams. There's a number of different sites out uh, on, on the internet that you can find some practice exams and practice questions. Um, oftentimes just seeing these, these questions in the format can help give you a leg up on when you actually get in the exam. Uh, focus on your weak areas, you know, those where, 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 where you're struggling. Um, try and join a study group. Having someone else or a group to hold you accountable is certainly beneficial. What I try and do is I get a list from APA each year in advance of the exam of everybody who signed up for a particular uh, exam window and try and connect them virtually just so we can have some virtual study groups just to share some resources, share some perspectives. This year's group have done a great job of setting up uh, virtual study sessions and, and I know Tyler and Josh in particular are both uh, very involved in those. Um, this one sounds silly, but also just, you know, make sure you know where your test center is for the day of the exam. There's nothing worse than arriving there stressed because you had to race because you struggled to find it. So just, you know, plan that out ahead of time. Um, as we said, the readings, you're going to be looking for a broad variety. We'll touch on some of those as we get to the specific sections. Um, but, but some of the overall ones that you're going to want to be familiar with, um, the practice of local government, also known as the Green Book. Um, they did the updated release of that in 2009. Um, the ethical planning practitioner, planning theory for practitioners, uh, planning and urban design standards. Those are some of the ones that you will definitely want to be familiar with, um, as I said, particularly that, 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 that Green Book and the updated uh, fourth edition. Um, those are the ones that, that I found to be the most beneficial in terms of giving you that overview of, of planning practice. All right, we're going to go through the content now. This is, uh, I've, I've pared down significantly from the overall presentation, so um, I'll try and, and, and tackle these verbally, but if there's particular aspects you want to go into a little bit more detail, by all means, let me know. So for the exam itself, it's broken down really into to five different categories. The fundamental planning knowledge, which is 25%, plan making implementation, which is 30%, areas of practice at 30%, leadership, administration, and management, which is 5%, and the code of ethics and professional conduct, which is 10%. So looking at the fundamental planning knowledge, um, they, what I, what I advise to, to those who are preparing for this is really for the history and the law, these are the ones where you're going to want to take the time to do that memorization because these are the ones that truly are the gimmies, as I call them on the exam. There's a very clear right and wrong answers for these ones. And so if you're able to, to have these memorized, have um, sort of for the history, you know, understanding the fundamental um, movements in, in, in the planning history, you know, things like the agrarian philosophy, the laissez-faire philosophy, um, city beautiful, city efficient, new urbanism, edge city, smart growth, knowing what those were, knowing the sequence of them, um, these, are, these are ways you can easily um, get, get a lot of the points for those ones. Other things that you want to make sure you're familiar with is the history of the American Planning Association. Um, examples of planning first, like where was the uh, first skyscraper, where was the first subway? Um, you're going to want to make sure you know the seminal books in planning. So the works of Jane Jacobs, um, Kevin Lynch with the image of the city, Jacob Reese, Patrick Geddes, his city of, in evolution, uh, urban, uh, rural by design by Randall Arendt. Um, these are some of the examples. You're going to want to make sure you're familiar with some of the planning pioneers and the key people in planning. So Daniel Burnham, Ian McCarg, Patrick Geddes, Paul Davidoff, Frank Lloyd Wright. Understand what the role that these uh, particular people played in planning. You know, make sure you're, under, you're, you're aware of the various landmarks in planning. Um, you know, Plan of Savannah, 1733, Central Park, how that came about. Um, so, the, this is a broad one, but, but, you know, this is one where I found, you know, things like flashcards. Um, really seem to help. Um, but, you know, everybody's got, got different methods of learning, but th this is one, again, where the memorization of some of these key things, these key moments and key uh, practices are, are going to be important. When you look at the legal principles and decisions, um, you're going to want to make sure you know things like key amendments to the Constitution, the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, what the re relevance of those are to planning. Make sure you're familiar with housing law, 
things like the Housing Act of 45, the Housing Act of 54, the Housing Act of 68. What changes those brought about, how they um, influence the, 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 the field. Um, cases to do with property rights, things like Euclid v. Ambler. Um, cases to do with eminent domain, which is Kilo is our, our most famous example there. Make sure, again, these are ones where, you know, you're going to want to know the case, you're going to want to know the year, because sometimes they ask you questions about sequencing and being aware of what the, what essentially led, what precedents led to, to, to future cases. So um, understanding those and, and having those memorized is, is going to be beneficial for the exam. Looking at the theories of and about planning, this becomes much, much broader, but you're going to want to understand things like synoptic planning, rational planning model, incremental planning, transactive planning theory, advocacy planning, radical planning, utopianism, methodism, um, just understanding what those are and how they can interact and, and where they're more appropriate. Uh, looking at patterns of human settlement, you're going to want to understand the growth and development of places over time. So understanding things like the concentric zone model, the sector model, uh, multiple nuclei model, um, understanding the shape of the city, the impact and the role of transportation in helping to shape urban form, so roads, um, or, or going back in time in terms of the impact of rivers on, on human settlement patterns. Understanding the cultural influences on the form of places, um, understanding, you know, historic preservation, no, noting the need for public spaces and buildings such as museums and art centers, how these all come to, to, together to play a role in, in, in human settlement patterns. You're going to want to understand the statutory basis of planning. So wanting to understand the relationships between local, state, and federal governments, um, understand different governance structures, um, how the structures are set up for zoning. You're going to want to understand general terminology and practices and principles of not only planning, but some related professions as well. Um, so understand. I don't see that. So, um, Kelly. It was me. Yeah, um, Kelly. What, what, yeah, what? I am. Um, just in general, again, um, not, I mean, again, I have a, a planning degree. So those, uh, the books that you, or the readings that you show, you showed, I guess, two slides ago, mm -hmm. are those the types of information that will, um, kind of give you some of these these historical context of which I know smatterings of what you've kind of been talking about but not not the details or will will that kind of come um, is that something you can sort of just research best documents to learn this information sure um, you know both are going to come into play though those books particularly the green book and and the updated version um, are great references for these um, you can find specific ones on on the history and you can find specific ones on the law um, particularly for the law it may be worth um, checking with university syllabus um, I know that's what I utilized for mine w w was the, the syllabus for the, the planning law classes um, to help research some of those key ones and, and help make these some of the flashcards. But okay, a lot that, of that's a good recommendation. That's why I was just curious if there were, um, you know, the tips on where, because again, you can't read all the books. I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of them. So, <laughs> but that, that's, a, that's a great idea. Thank you. Right. And again, you know, these questions are not going to go into the key um, nth degree nuance of, of what one of these pioneers or one of these authors was saying, but they want to make sure that you have an understanding of what the broad principle that they brought to the field was. What was their key contribution? How they, um, you know, influenced the field? Not, not a specific fine nuance of, of the argument they were making. So it's, it's really about understanding that, that in the broader context, but, but, but yeah, thanks, thanks for asking that. And, and as I said, there are a multitude of different ones. Some of, um, some of the planning sites do have um, essentially flashcards already made, I believe, with some of these. Um, the Plan Edison course, I think, does run through these as well. Um, so there are a couple different options for, for ways to get that as well. There are, Andrew, if you don't mind me jumping in. Sure. At, least, at least there used to be, I think it was um, North Carolina, the North Carolina State chapter used to have a really good legal resource too. And there are a couple other chapters that have kind of like very specific um, 
like study notes that were really helpful as well. So if I can remember what those are, I'll try to also send that information out. Yeah, the Texas chapter has some great ones. Florida used to, but it's it's uh, a little harder to access now. But yeah, there are there and um, this is where again I think there is a benefit to to collaborating with other preparers just to, because there is so much out there. So if you can help divide it up um, and work together, there's a benefit to that. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, so we're talking about uh, general terminology of other practices and principles of related professions. So understanding, you know, generally the public health profession and, and um, what the interaction is with planning, architecture, how that comes into play, uh, attorneys, civil engineers, realtors, landscape architects, environmentalists, and, and just understanding how those different fields all work together in collaboration with planning. Um, looking at the natural, social, and economic systems, again, this is one where it, it's things like understanding the impacts of planning and, and climate change and, and how they come into play. And then finally, looking at the core values of planning, um, APA has articulated what these are and sort of they, they, for the core values, they, they, they've highlighted equity and social justice, public interest, sustainability, transparency, healthy and prosperous communities, diversity, and demogra uh, democratic engagement. And so just being aware of, of those different philosophies and, and, and how they play a core role in planning. So moving on to plan making and implementation, this is, a, again, where it's looking a little bit more about the specific knowledge that you have. Um, some of the key books um, here are actually not so much books, but it's, it's looking at the planning advisory service reports um, that APA puts out from, from uh, the members. And that these are now all free to, to APA members. So going through and getting an understanding of, of the different positions that APA has highlighted through these, these PAS reports. Um, but looking at them some of the more specifically when you're conducting research and acquiring knowledge, understanding the differences between quantitative and qualitative research, um, understanding simple, some certain concepts in, in quantitative research, mean, median, mode, um, what they are, how they would apply, um, understanding the importance of the U.S. Census, how that comes into play, uh, different surveying techniques, what are the strengths and weaknesses, um, when you do qualitative research, what, what are the benefits of, of, of a qualitative study versus a quantitative study? Um, spatial analysis has become increasingly a, a, an important tool in, in the conveying the message of planning as well as the, the actual analysis. And so having some understanding of mapping and GIS and how that can be useful. Um, public engagement, what are, um, why is public participation and public engagement so important? What are the different uh, participation methods that could be utilized? Um, meetings, presentations, workshops, surveys, um, understanding concerns about sample size, cost, possible bias, utilizing visioning sessions, um, SWOT analyses, charrettes. What are all the different sort of places that these might be appropriate? Uh, increasingly, the role of social media is something that comes up um, as an important public engagement tool. Um, advocacy planning, and the uh, different levels in the ladder of citizen participation. Um, this is uh, Saul Linsky's organizations come into play here. Communications, another key aspect to, to focus on and looking at um, planners needing to have successful, successful and uh, effective oral and written communication skills. Um, trying to avoid using too much planning jargon, uh, making sure that, that the message is, is clearly and easily understood by the general public. When you're preparing to plan, um, working on visioning and goal setting and making sure in advance to identify key issues, um, utilizing forecasting, uh, things like population estimates and projections. And so in those ones, understanding the difference between a projection and an estimate understanding things like population pyramids, how those would be read. One of the things that I, I laugh about and tease and as, as someone with an economics undergraduate degree, um, you always, I've, I've heard about every, everyone I've spoken to had at least one question on their exam related to either shift share analysis or location quotient, um, which are just different ways of looking at uh, the measure of the local economy as compared to the surrounding regional or national economy. And so wanting to understand how those come into play. 
When you're formulating plans and policies, understanding the importance of creating and evaluating alternatives, what some of the visualization techniques that you can use and how those can be effective in, in conveying a message. When you're looking at plan implementation, what are some of the, the ways that plans can actually be implemented? So things like future land use plans, zoning maps, zoning ordinances, uh, zoning administration, subdivision regulations. Um, what are the roles that different people and different organizations play in those in terms of planning commissions, board of appeals, city councils, or, or, or um, board of supervisors? Um, budgeting is also one to, to look at with plan implementation because uh, if, a, if a plan is, is outside the realm of the budget, unfortunately, it's not really worth the paper it's, it's uh, printed on if you can't actually implement it as well as the importance of demonstration projects and how those can be useful in uh, implementing a plan as a first step to help uh, generate buy-in. Moving along, you, it's important to have that monitoring and assessment so you have the measures of performance and the outcome indicators that you're looking for, um, making sure that you understand how, how to uh, realistically set those up. Um, project or program management, so this is a little bit more of the, the technical side when you're looking at um, RFPs, RFQs, grants, preparing budgets for projects, um, making sure that they are manageable and managed appropriately in that way. And finally, looking at uh, social justice, and particularly in this time, it's, that's a key aspect um, that, that we as planners need to make sure that we're, we're keeping aware of. And so making sure that um, we are planning for diverse and underserved communities and advocating for social justice. Uh, the Code of Ethics states that, that we as planners shall seek social justice by working to expand choice and opportunity for all persons, recognizing a special responsibility to plan for the needs of the disadvantaged and to promote racial and economic integration. And so wanting to make sure that, that in whatever program or, or plan that's being set up, that this is being addressed and considered in the development. So then we move on to the areas of practice. And again, this is about another third of the exam. And I think I'm gonna try and skip through this one with, with, with less of the uh, particular examples, just because it could take us quite a while otherwise. Um, Suffice to say that you know we're looking here at, again, planning advisory service reports to help inform these. Um, your interact that you receive from the APA, which cites many local examples, or not local, but na many national examples that are taking place of various uh, good, good planning efforts. Um, some of the, the I'm trying to find here some of the, the specific PAS reports that are listed, um, things like hazard mitigation, planning for wind energy, green infrastructure, planning for solar energy, uh, planning for post-disaster recovery. This is really where you're going to want to try and broaden outside your particular niche that you focus on. Because again, the exam is going to be testing your knowledge as a planner period, not a, a site planner, not a transportation planner, not a, um, not in any one given silo. So you're going to want to make sure you have as broad a knowledge as possible. I was very grateful uh, leading up to my exam that I sat next to a historic preservation planner and got to hear a number of his conversations that he was having on phone calls and things like that. And just for osmosis was able to pick up some of the thing because when I took my exam, there were a couple of questions on historic preservation and um, without have had having had that advantage of, of just sitting and listening to him, I'm not sure that I would have necessarily known the answers. So you're going to want to try and, as I said, this is where, where that advice at the beginning of, of find your weaknesses and, and try and, and focus on those in terms of broadening your knowledge and your appreciation. Uh, so you can see the ones, all, all the different fields listed here. Um, it is a wide, wide variety. And again, you're not necessarily going to be expected to know the deep, deep, nuanced, specific details of this, but you are going to be expected to know at, at a high level some of the broad questions um, pertaining to these different aspects of planning and how they, um, how they fit into to, to the larger picture. So leadership, administration, and management. Again, this is a very, very small section and uh, traditionally I found those who are taking the AICP exam haven't, aren't necessarily in positions in their organizations where these are 
uh, they're as familiar with these, but it's just wanting to make sure that you're understanding external relationships, understanding internal organizational management, understanding technology and related applications, how all these different things can help um, push, push the planning field forward, how you can help to ensure that you are as effective as possible by actually with external relationships, managing relationships with board members or council members or members of the public, um, ensuring that you're responsive to those, those groups and those organizations. Finally, the code of ethics and professional conduct. Again, similar to the law and the history, this is one where you're gonna to wanna to take the time to really memorize uh, the code of ethics and make sure that you have it, it down pat and are very, very familiar with it. Um, these are again, ones where there's clearly, um, well, there's not necessarily clearly a right answer, but there's, they're, they're, you're going to have a most right answer that you're looking for. You're looking for the one that is, um, applicable in an ideal world scenario. So uh, while I hate to say it, if you're a, a single planner in a small town and your brother-in-law comes in with an application, well, that certainly does have the appearance of a conflict of interest, even if you are able to be as objective as possible. In a real world with a single planner, you're not gonna be able to, to find someone else to be able to handle that application. But in, the, the world that this exam is taking place, you would want to ideally subcontract with someone else or somehow remove yourself from the process of that evaluation. So again, look for that, that not necessarily how you would handle it in your current work environment, but how you would handle it in the real world as the, as the correct answer for these, these questions. The code of ethics, you can find those on the, uh, the planning website. There is that, that ethical planning practitioner book that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, we do have the cases of the year that, that APA puts out um, that we do at the, the annual conference. Um, I believe that there's a recorded version of that. If you go to the, um, the chapters website at the moment and you look at the AICP CM opportunities, I think we have one of those listed currently. And so you can get, a, get an example of real world ethics questions that have come up in the past year that, that have faced planners. So that's it for the exam itself. Um, I'll stop for a second just to see if there are any questions because that's a lot of information that we covered very, very quickly. And so if, if you wanna see if anybody's got any particular questions or if there are any aspects that you'd like to go into greater detail on, on regarding the exam. No? Okay. Well, we'll go on then to the essays and um, then we'll come back for some more questions at the end. So for the essays, either, um, at the end of, uh, of your earning your experience as, as a candidate or in advance of taking the exam in the traditional route. Hey, Andy. Um, yeah. We did, we did get um, a question pop up in the chat. Okay. Um, it asked, what census information should we know? Really, the key thing with the census information is understanding what sort of things are you able to get from the census. Um, understanding that the census takes place every 10 years and is, is really a chance to understand um, the demographics of your community, understanding how that census information is used uh, and that it's used essentially to help allocate state and federal funding to localities uh, based on, on the information that's there. So th those are kind of the key, key sort of aspects that you wanna make sure you're familiar with. All right, so the essays, um, as I said, there's gonna be three, three essay questions that you're asked to answer. I pulled the information here uh, directly from the tips for applicants. And, and so we'll go through these, these fairly quickly. But the key thing for all of these that you're going to want to do is, is read very specifically the question um, you're going to be asked about your experiences and not simply your job description. Um, you're not simply, for the most part, going to be asked to, to list off what you did, but rather how you as a planner played a role in, in what they're asking. So for the first one, where you're asked to demonstrate a professional level of responsibility and resourcefulness while applying a planning process appropriate to the project or situation. 
This one is, is, is far more process oriented than, than most of the other questions. Um, but you, you want to make sure, as I said, the, these are the instructions that, that are taken straight from the, uh, the guidance that are given on this. And so you're going to want to make sure that you follow these closely. Um, and in particular, uh, well, here, sorry, here are some of the examples. Uh, you know, so the planning process you could be working on a comprehensive plan, sub area plan, doing development review looking for uh, land use site selection or entitlement if you're on the private sector side, and what your responsibilities may have been in terms of collecting, analyzing, or visualizing the data, or facilitating meetings, or preparing staff reports. So in this one, you do need to make sure that you describe your application in a step-by-step -step basis of what you did. Make sure that you talk about your specific roles in, and, and your responsibilities in this process. Um, sometimes folks have a, a tendency to want to highlight the most impressive project that they've been involved in when their involvement in it was just at a very small or tangential level. Um, rather focus on something where you, it may be a small project, but that you had a, an active role in, in, in bringing to, to bear and bring to fruition. And so in this one, you want to explain how you brought that professional knowledge or skills into play in this process. So again, don't list multiple activities or multiple um, projects that you worked on. Really, this is wanting to focus on a specific one that you worked on and, and what your role was. And so again, don't focus on just a single step, but focus on a single project from essentially start to finish and your role that you played in it. For the second one, um, you want to cite an example where you were evaluating multiple impacts to a community when implementing a professional planning task. So again, this could be a, a, a sub-area plan, land use development or regulations, awareness campaign, and sort of looking at some of the consequences that you could have been considering were effects on housing choice or affordability or transportation access or on historic or cultural resources. And again, what you want to do here is essentially identify your thought processes as a planner. When you were going through this project, what were some of the considerations that came into place that led you to um, take or not take specific actions. And so, and then you want to talk about what the ultimate outcome was there. You don't want to focus simply on the procedural steps of we received the application, we reviewed it against our uh, development guidelines, we scheduled a public hearing, we provided a presentation, and the board decided on an outcome. You know, that, that's not what's being asked here. They want to really know how you came up with potential conditions that were being proposed, how you uh, engaged the public to, to understand what their concerns were in a process. Um, so hopefully that, that, that's clear on that one. And finally, the third essay, they want to understand how you've influenced the public decision making in the public interest. Um, and again, this is, this is a, a very, very relevant question in light of everything going on in our world today, but wanting to understand how you've um, sought to highlight those concerns that, that may not be readily apparent. Um, so the methods of influence that they could be, examples could be formal written recommendations, uh, research or policy briefs, educational or outreach training activities, um, and the decision points are, are essentially, you know, a, a formal decision or a body uh, reaching a decision on an action, a judge or a court issue, a chief elected officer signing off on them. So again, you want to highlight those specific examples that um, you raised an issue that had not been considered, you raised awareness of a particular aspect that was not um, readily apparent, and what your considerations were, how you um, were able to raise these points uh, through, through your uh, research, your reporting, whatever the case may be. And then make sure that you show how this was then um, implemented or, or acted on by the decision-making body or the uh, elected official. Um, you don't want to cite an example where you were unsuccessful, where you raised concerns and then ultimately those were ignored or, or voted down by the decision-making body. Um, so really, it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity to try and highlight uh, a chance where you got to make a difference as a planner in a large, large way. 
So that really sums up what I've pulled together here on these three different aspects. Um, Wow, I'm just sharing. Um, as I said, there's a lot of information thrown at you very, very quickly. And, and so uh, really want to just open it up and see if there's any particular aspects that, that anyone wants to focus on a little bit more, any, any um, different things that uh, you want to ask. Uh, I know some of the, the, the questions uh, were talked that, that, that I was asked in advance were, best resources for studying, for preparing for this. Um, as I said, APA has a study guide. Plan Edison has um, a study course that I've heard very, very good things about from, from, from everyone that I've spoken to. That's been the most well-reviewed um, study resource. You uh, say uh, the Plan Edison uh, study course that they have. Um, Again, I can't endorse any one over another, but I've heard nothing but positives about that particular uh, resource for those, who, if you want to go out and purchase a, a study guide or a study course. Yeah, I, I actually took it when I took the exam back in 2013. Um, I, one of the really good things about it, and, and then Cameron has his hand up too, so I wanna make sure he knows that we're gonna get to him. One of the really good things about it is that it also includes practice tests and the instructors, I think, um, audit the exam every so often. So they kind of stay on top of it if there are any significant changes to the structure, but it has practice exams, which are pretty close to the types and depth of questions that would be asked. Um, for me, Kelly, I'm kind of similar. I have an engineering degree and a policy degree. I don't have a planning degree. so. What, what that did was it doesn't have all the information in that class, but it will help you kind of structure how to, um, how, how to study and how, how, to what extent you need to try to learn the information. So that was really helpful. Um, and then Cameron has his hand up. Yeah, so, um... I'm, I guess my question is kind of weird. It's not really about the, the test itself or the content of the test, but I was wondering if there's like any sort of deadlines for, I guess, scheduling your test. Like I had thought that you had to basically say you're going to take the test during the next, next cycle, like six months ahead of time. And one of my friends told me that's not true. So I just, I didn't know if anyone has an answer to that. Yeah. You're not obligated to take it in, in the next window. Um, there is a time limit. I'm afraid I, off the top of my head, I don't recall exactly what it is in terms of how, how many times you can kind of defer taking the test. Um, but I would recommend not taking the test until you feel confident and ready to take it. Um, it you know, for better or for worse, it, it is a, a somewhat stressful experience to take that test. Um, and so you do want to go into it feeling good and feeling ready and feeling confident um, that you know the material. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, I'd also be interested for anybody who's a little bit farther along in the process if they have any resources that they've been using that they wanted to share with the group. I think that would be helpful too. So I know Josh and Tyler have been instrumental in, in the current study group that's going on um, based out of Richmond. So if, if you guys have anything you'd like to share, um, that'd be great. Sure, Tyler. Do you want to do you want to start off with our um, our Google Drive site and some some information we've created, and then um, maybe we can tag off each other. All right. Well, I'll just I'll take lead then. So um, we were very 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 thankful to have Andrew's email come in um, kind of February March I think early spring late winter early spring as we were getting ready for the late spring exams um, because <clears throat> it, it, it helps to have a study group and um, whether that group meets in person or whether it's a small group or a large group it does help keep motivation so we found a tremendous number of resources um, 
I actually took a preparatory course from the Arizona chapter and they had <laughs> years of reading material that they provided uh, to the registrants of the, uh, the prep course. And um, I've been working my way through it. I know some other, there was another person registered uh, who's taking the exam, I think at the end of June. And she also has been working her way through it, like you, Sandy and Kelly. Uh, she has an engineering degree in engineering practice. And uh, so it's, you know, there are a lot of fundamentals that are just not something she covered in a classroom before. Um, that's been very helpful. And, and they do it, um, I don't know if they do it twice a year or once a year, but they, they do it regularly. And um, I was not alone. She and I were not alone being outside of the Arizona region in joining that course. And it was, it was well worth attending. There's, you know, there's a fee for it. It's not gratis, um, but it was, it was very helpful. The other, uh, one other thing that I found is very helpful. If you just type in AICP uh, practice exam, there is a Google drive site that has uh, something like seven or eight years of questions that go back to 2000. I think it's uh, 11 and go up to about 2017 and they their practice exams on an annual basis and uh, unlike plan Edison it's not a course it's just a, a guy chose to post all these practice practice exams and they were they've been really good um, so we tag teamed in our course in our excuse me in our core group with meeting and going over content and then meeting and just doing practice exams together as a as an exercise um, the other thing that we did was as we started um, practicing, we had uh, Cassie Patterson, who's a recent graduate of the VCU program with uh, the Tyler went through as schoolmates. And Cassie had taken the exam in November and had some recollection um, of the questions that she felt unsure about and might have been part of the reason um, she didn't get the passing exam uh, rate and so grade. And so she shared some of those kind of out brief questions with the group, as well as her whole study content organization, which came from the Pennsylvania chapter. Mm -hmm. So together with the Pennsylvania chapter is kind of the fundamentals. And, um, and then Cassie's kind of on point, you know, these are some specific questions that that she saw in November. Um, we built a it's an Excel. Well, it's a Google documents sheets document. And we, we put all the, the history and the law courses in a chronological format that, that basically is like a big timeline. And so, you know, like you, Andrew, I have a history uh, undergraduate. And so, you know, I think in timelines anyway. So we, we made a timeline. And, and I encourage anybody who, who is looking for flashcards to look at cram.com. And cram.com, you know, will basically have flashcards for any subject you think of. There are, I think it's, um, it's well over 300 different flashcard groups that show up if you just put in AICP exam or AICP practice. And what you see is a lot of people doing it for themselves. Like Andrew's talking about looking at flashcards for yourself and there's no, you know, that muscle memory has to get developed one way or the other. Um, a lot of times you learn by doing. And so what we learned by putting our version of a timeline together was, you know, we brought in material from other sources and we talked about the plan of Savannah, but I also talked about the plan of Columbia, South Carolina, because I'm from Columbia and Columbia and Raleigh and DC, they all have a very interesting parallel early Republic history um, of planned capital cities. And so you learn just by engaging the material and organizing your, yourself. So we're happy to share what we did but we encourage it to be a departure point for, for anybody else studying. And that includes individuals and, and groups. Well, I think Josh, you've also hit on there kind of one of the key aspects and why we try and encourage that, that study group to, to exist is just everybody's coming at it from different backgrounds and different levels of expertise in the different realms. And so it's great when you've got someone who's, well-versed in historic preservation who can explain a concept, who, who can explain the importance of, you know, different architectural guidelines and, and how they play into community building or something like that, um, or a transportation planner who can help explain, you know, the difference between mobility and accessibility and, and, and sort of all those different aspects. And, and 
really help lay things out on a more personal level. Um, and because we all are, as I said, are all coming from different backgrounds and have different strengths and weaknesses. And so when, when you put them together as a group, I think it really does help that overall learning. Yeah, absolutely. We, we had um, land use, land development, development review planners, transportation planners, uh, historic preservation is one of my areas of uh, particular experience. And so I was able to add that. And it was, it was really, it's, uh, we had one person who really took on law and, and mastered the subject of law. And we have this really interesting, almost a pivot table of uh, cases by chronology as well as by subject. And, um, you know, it's still a pretty broad area to, to be a legal expert in the planning and land use field. But, um, but we've got a, but we've got a good matrix. Um, and we have a real expert in our group, which is nice. Terrific. The other benefit there in my mind, and, and, and um, Josh, I think you can certainly attest to this, is just the networking benefit that comes from, from being involved in a group like this as well, is that, uh, you know, again, we, we all come from different backgrounds, but it's nice to be able to have someone that you can reach out to, uh, to ask a question about this outside of even the AICP preparation, uh, you know, a year down the road. Or so. I'm glad you said uh, we were we were all happy to share and uh, and Cassie in particular who who had just been through Cassie Patterson who had just been through the exam in November was um, just an example of of all the other folks that joined us out of the 20 or 30 that were you know engaged at various times in our in our virtual study group to the spring and um, yeah every any one of us is um, super happy to have made the connections that we probably would have taken years to make any other way so thank you for getting us in touch with each other sure. So Hi, this is Kelly again, Josh, um, you know, just to get a, a context of the time. So, so you're sort of registering um, your intent to take the AICP exam about six months prior. And then Andrew, you were able to then provide that information. So I, I was just curious how long that group met Were you, you know, over a, is it a four month period, a three month, you know, yeah, that's I was curious the, the, the process from when you you met these folks and you went through the the, the study group. I'll let Ans Andrew uh, answer the first one. Yeah, I, I essentially get a, a notification from APA National of everybody who's eligible to take the exam. So they may not necessarily be taking it, but they've either submitted their essays or they're an AICP candidate who's um, met the uh, education requirement and, and kind of have signed up for that initial stage. Okay. So, um, so again, it's, 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 it's the folks who um, are planning to take it or they've started the process in some way. So they may, and what I say to those who, who don't necessarily feel like they're ready is, is that there's still a benefit to joining the group now um, just because again, it, it helps to, to you don't know what you don't know until you're exposed to it. <laughs> so it's, it's a chance to get to, to, to get um, exposed, an initial exposure to the sort of material that you're going to be expected to understand and to know. Um, in, in terms of this particular group, I'll let Josh uh, in, in a second talk in a little bit more detail. They ended up having a little bit more time because the exam got pushed back because of current circumstances. Um, but in a normal scheme, you're usually looking at, at sort of a, a two and a half to three month window that that the group has access to each other and generally I would recommend that folks are doing um, some studying certainly outside of the group as well and, and preparing in advance of that but I think it's a great chance to to come together if you're particularly if you're struggling with a particular aspect struggling with with a particular topic um, to be able to to reach out to some peers and, and see if you can get some assistance there as well and so Josh I'll let you um, talk about how frequently and how how long you guys have been meeting for. Absolutely. So you get you get word of within I don't know is it two or three weeks of um, submitting your final documents to to APA. I think it's 14, 14 plus days, give or take, before you hear back whether you're something like that. Within two or three weeks, I think of the of the cutoff for everybody. You start hearing back when if you're going to be accepted for that period, which which is six roughly six months out, and so at that point, you know you're you're waiting, and then all of a sudden, 
uh, depending on your motivation, what's going on, you, you start getting fired up, right? And so uh, we started getting fired up in mid to late January. And, um, and it was, I think, uh, first or second week in February that we heard from Andrew as he was starting to get everybody's names, I think, and then he was getting ready to communicate with folks. So we started. Um, and sorry, Josh, if I can just interrupt for a second and, and just a little bit more detail in terms of what I do is I reach out to everybody in, in a blind copy email, um, yep. inviting them to participate in the group and, and to let me know if they'd like to. And so those who, who indicate that they would like to, then I connect them to one another. Yeah, thank you. So, so when we when we were able to take advantage of that groundwork, then what we were doing was asking folks if they wanted to organize really mostly regionally, because I wasn't interested in in traveling to Lynchburg or um, you know, much beyond Fredericksburg for, for study groups if I didn't need to. But we had no idea how many people were registered at the time until Andrew kind of clued us in on the kind of the, um, you know, the envelope of how many people were, were in, the, in the testing window. I didn't know if there were 10 people registered in Central Virginia or there were gonna be 50. I, I just didn't, we didn't know. So then we, once we had the group of people we still didn't necessarily know where everybody was. So it took a week or week and a half to sort of put some questions out there about um, us being in central Virginia and, you know, that we would be willing to travel 45, 50 minutes away for study groups, but that was probably the outer edge of where we would be traveling to. And so we knew that there were going to be people who, who didn't want to travel to Richmond. And like I said, we didn't want to travel to Hampton Roads. Well, everything changed in mid March, which I'll get to in a second, but, we, we started organizing basically in, um, in person in late February. So after a few weeks had worked out and people were starting to get in touch and we were hearing from people and we knew, in some cases, we knew of people who knew some people. Um, then we, we had a plan to meet uh, weekly and um, it would be Saturdays for two hours, two or three hours and just go through content to start with. And we came up with a, a plan where we could basically lay out what about um, eight to 12 weeks look like. And so we laid all that out and then we started talking about midweek, midweek get togethers and time off for uh, Easter and Mother's Day and, and other things that we wanted to um, avoid. Tyler and I happen to work in the same uh, for the same folks. And so, you know, we have some public meetings that are at the same time that we could we would know that there were things we had to plan around. Um, but basically we just kind of pulled everybody. When do you want to meet? How long do you want to meet? What do you want to cover? And then we started, uh, we started covering our material. We, we collected information that EPA Virginia had identified as good places to go to. And then from there that led us to some other places. So we set up a Google drive site and um, we have not met weekly for, you know, for all of three months. Um, but we have had some, we, we it, it's been a, it's been a really good experience. Um, things changed in March and we went all virtual uh, completely after the second week of March. And so then we had some people who we had had dial in to a couple meetings, but it was much less uh, normal to be the one or two, you know, people on the phone when everybody else was in person. Uh, if we had eight or 10 people in person and then all of a sudden everybody was going to be virtual. So then we switched. It actually facilitated a lot of things for us to be able to, to talk to other folks. Um, there's still a lot of people from Northern Virginia we never heard from, and uh, they knew that in early, you know, late March and early April that we were virtual, and I hope they got together. We've asked a couple times about people getting together. I, I hope they're ready. Um, but yeah, it's been really good. So we, you know, we, we've extended our study periods. I'm taking in June. Tyler's taking first week in July. Um, it went from a two-week testing window to an eight-week testing, uh, eight-week testing window. So it's kind of all scattered around. Um, we have one test taker who's scheduling around the uh, expecting expecting birth of her child in July. So she's taking in June to make sure she's ahead of it. Um, she takes the, she, Sandy. She takes the PE in uh, August or September, I think. <laughs> So, that's, not, not, not stressful with a baby at all. <laughs> not at all. She'll have a lot of time. 
<laughs> she thinks. Right, right. <laughs> well, thank you. That was um, that was just really helpful. Just kind of just really give a, a just a synopsis of the process and sort of um, that commitment. If you can find that group of really getting something you know powerful to to help you prepare for the for the test. So thank you for that. Well, sure. and, and I will also add that this year or this this Windows group have been the most involved that I've seen uh, in four years of doing this. Um, some years it's more just a sharing of resources. Other years there's been very little interest whatsoever. This this has been the group that's taken the most advantage of it, and I think they've gotten far and away the most out of it in terms of assistance and being prepared for one another. Well. We've, we, well, we appreciate all your help and support, Andrew. It's, it, it's been great to be connected to folks that, like you said, that's been a great networking opportunity. And I'm a, I'm a strong believer in professional development. And this is, um, this is really a little bit of a crucible of a learning experience for a lot of people that, you know, they may not practice for 20 years, some of these concepts, but uh, it's a great opportunity to learn some different things. I think, Andrew, do, is there a general guideline for, um, I feel like I remember I was told probably like I should plan to spend about 40 to 60 hours studying or something like that. Do you have a general guideline for? It's, it's so hard to give one, to be honest, because everybody's coming at it from a different place and a different background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it sounds cliche, but I, I think it, it's really going to be a case of, of prepare until you feel comfortable it's, and, and you never feel fully comfortable or fully ready because there's just so much material that's out there uh, in all the different uh, fields of planning. Um, but again, to me, if, if, if you're comfortable with the law, if you're comfortable with the history, if you're comfortable with the ethics, those are really your gimme points. And if you know you're going to get those points, the other ones, uh, you're going to get a lot of those through your experience. Make sure you know silly things like 43,560, the uh, square feet in an acre, because that's something that, that, that often comes up in, in sort of a calculation that you may have. You know, know how to do things like floor area ratio. Um, you know, you, you, you may well, you're likely going to have some computational things in there. Um, and again, just how comfortable people are with those just depends on what their background is and how how um, what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis so you know that's why I, I think there's a benefit to starting early just so you can get a sense of how much there is to cover and how much um how long it's going to take you to to, to, to cover the different aspects to feel comfortable with it um. And then did anybody have anything else to add? Because the, the last thing I wanted to go over is we're currently, I believe that application window is open currently. Is that correct, Andrew? Correct, yes. So, um, you know, I wanna make sure we cover any other questions, but if not, I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned that the application window is open. So if you are planning to go ahead and apply right now, make sure you're looking at that, meeting your deadlines, um, getting any sort of information you need from your employer, that kind of thing, to, so you don't miss it. And then I believe the test will be in early November. Correct, yep. And hopefully we'll be back on a more regular schedule of just a two week window, testing window at that stage. But again, if you have questions about it, if you have ones, by all means, reach out to me, um, you know, pdo at apavirginia.com. Um, happy to answer any questions, happy to um, point you towards resources, um, happy to help in any way I can. Any other last questions or comments? You, Sandy, as well as Andrew. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Well, thank you all for um, Thank you all for making some time. Thank you, Andrew, for making this available. We will, um, I'll let you all know when we get this out, we'll, um, we'll get it up on the, I, I don't know what the turnaround time frame is for that, Andrew, but we'll- That's fine. Yeah, we'll get it on, we'll get it on YouTube somehow and, uh, and, uh, and the APA Virginia chapter will put it up. But if you have any other questions, if you need to connect with anybody, you all have my contact information as well and I'll be happy to put you in touch with with anybody, but otherwise, um, best of luck to you all and uh, 
hopefully uh, we'll be seeing a lot more AICPs behind some of your names here in the next uh, in the next few months. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thank Have you. a good day, everyone.